All right, the purpose of this video is to go through some more details about significant figures and about uh, doing some calculations related to significant figures, which should help you with your homework assignment uh, for post-lecture 2-2. So uh, hopefully we'll go through this relatively quickly and give you some help. And certainly if you have questions as you go through things along the way, please feel free to reach out to me and, and take care of those questions exactly. So we ended our discussion last class talking about exact numbers. Exact numbers being the ones that have an infinite or unlimited number of significant figures. And we talked about things that are involved in counting. So if I want to count the number of keys on the keyboard or the number of donuts in a box, those would be exact numbers. Um, there wouldn't be any ambiguity or any question on their measurement or how precise their measurement is. Um, we also can talk about things like... Uh, constants, numbers that are involved in uh, calculations involving um, equations. So, you know, things like constants fall into um, the second category where we, we generally won't count them that way. Other th things are defined quantities like this one down here. This is a defined quantity. There are exactly 2.54 centimeters in an inch. We can also think of other kinds of definitions. Um, so I gave the example in class of, you know, 12 objects in a dozen. But you can think of other ones as as well. Um, you know, thirty six inches in a yard, um, twelve inches in a foot. Those are those are exact quantities. Um, and our metric conversions that we've talked about thus far fall into the similar kind of category. There are one hundred centimeters in a meter. There are one thousand millimeters in a meter, and and so on. So let's just take a little time and do just a little bit of practice with using significant figures. So our first number here, 26. Um, remember, any number that is non-zero is a significant digit. And so since those are the only two digits there, we have two significant digits in this number. For the second number, remember, zeros at the end of a number generally do not count, but if we see a decimal point, any numbers that fall after that decimal point will count if they're preceded by a non-zero number, and this one is. So all five of these digits in front of the decimal are significant. The two that come after the digit are significant as well. That's a total of seven significant digits. In this third one, again, we've got a decimal point but the digits don't count until we get to a non-zero digit. So these ones don't count. We're only going to be looking at the ones that we have starting with the three. So three, four, one, six, that's a total of four significant digits. These zeros at the beginning do not count. Scientific notation is a great way of expressing significant digits. Anything that is in the scientific notation is a significant digit. So the fact that I've got a nine here, that's a significant digit. It's the only digit there. So there's only one significant digit in that number. This here looks like a complicated mess, but it indicates in some kind of way that there are all of these digits of precision here. They're all significant. So in total, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight digits. All of those digits are significant. So anytime we have a number in scientific notation, we have to know the digits that are listed in that number are significant digits. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons why we use scientific notation. Scientific notation is great about not having any ambiguity associated with it. You know exactly how many digits are going into it because that's what the number shows. Um, I'd invite you to try these ones um, with me. So uh, if you're watching along here on YouTube, uh, go ahead and pause the video right now and try to do these four on their own, on your own. This was originally designed as a pair deck question, which is why this 88 um, number here is here as well. But go ahead and just see how many significant figures are in each of these values. And if a number is exact, then, then say that is exact. And I'll start to reveal the answers in five, four, three, two, one. So for the first measurement here, really pretty straightforward. There are three digits in this number. None of the digits are zero, so we don't have to worry about any of the zero rules. All three of these digits are significant. This is a three-digit number. For number two, there are 12 cans of soda in the break room refrigerator. Well, the only way I would know that there are 12 cans of soda is if I counted them. There's no such thing as a partial can of soda. So there's no estimation involved. This would be an exact number. For the third one, I've got an ice cube that weighs 37.88 grams. That ice cube, well, there are no zeros here, so each one of those digits is significant. There are four sig figs in this particular measurement of that mass. For number four, I've got a different mass, a different ice cube. I see 31.99999 grams. Well, again, all of these numbers are zero, are non-zero, so they all count. They're all significant, all seven of them. We move on now to talking about significant figures in calculated values. So where we see this applied most often is when we start to actually do something with our measurements and not just simply measure things. And so there are a couple of key guidelines that come into the overall process of using significant figures in calculations that uh, we want to make sure that we know and understand before we even get to the calculation rules themselves. First and foremost, we want to limit the number of times we round. Every time we round numbers, we are introducing small amounts of experimental error. So we want to try to limit that as much as possible. So if I'm doing a series of multiplications or a series of divisions or a series of functions of the same kind, so multiplying and dividing, that's considered the same kind of function. Adding and subtracting, that's considered the same kind of function. Even though they are you know, opposite functions of each other, they are kind of doing the same thing. Multiplication and division are you know, very closely related to each other. Addition and subtraction are closely related to each other. But so if I'm doing a string of multiplications, for example, I don't want to round my answer every time I multiply a new term to this. I'm going to wait till the very end. So if I've got five multiplications to do in a row, I'm going to plug all five of those calculations into my calculators um, together. And at the very end, then I'm going to try to figure out what the total number of significant figures should be. And the reason I do this is because every time I round, I'm introducing a small amount of error into my calculation. And so the more I round, the more error I'm introducing and the less reliable my calculation is actually going to be. The second guideline that we want to go through and, and pay attention to is something called the weakest link principle. Now, generally speaking, what that means is that when we do our rounding, we are going to round to the decimal place or to the number of digits that matches the measurement with the fewest decimal places or digits. Now, why are we using that language decimal place slash number of digits? Well, because there are different rules that are going to be applied based on whether we add and subtract or if we multiply and divide. 
And so the idea here, just as a general guideline, is if I'm multiplying and dividing, I'm going to look at the number of digits. And after I do that string of multiplication or that string of divisions, I'm going to round my number to the measurement that had the fewest digits in it. That way I'm not overestimating the precision of my worst measurement. And the same thing is true when we add and subtract. Now, when we add and subtract, we're more concerned about decimal place than we are number of digits. And so that plays into our rules a little bit here as well. So the best way to work on these kinds of skills is to practice them. And we're going to take a good minute here and practice these. You'll also get a good amount of practice in your homework assignment as well. So when it comes to adding and subtracting, subtracting, what we want to look at, and this is a really key idea, we want to look at the number of decimal places that each one of the measurements has and round to the leftmost decimal place because the last most decimal place would be the least precise decimal place. So if I'm adding these two numbers together, I've got 10.0111 or 011, and I've got 11.01. .01. If I add them together, my calculator gives me this. Problem with this number is that it doesn't match the precision of all of my measurements. This particular measurement is known to three decimal places. This measurement, on the other hand, is only known to two decimal places. So if I take a marker here and shade which decimal places are estimated, this is an estimated digit, and this is an estimated digit. And so if we look at the final result, what we see is that there are in fact two estimated digits in this final calculated number. There is the number here in blue, which represents the first measured number. And there is the number here in orange, which represents the second estimated number. So there are two different numbers in that final answer that we could think of as being estimated. Now, knowing from our discussion of significant figures this afternoon, we know that there can only be one estimated digit. And so the rule of thumb is we apply the weakest link principle. The weakest link principle says we are going to round to the least precise measurement. The least precise measurement is the leftmost digit, this one right here. And so this value isn't going to be reflected as 21.021 it's going to be reflected as 21.02. And the reason why is that this is the only estimated digit that is allowed. You're not allowed to have more than one estimated digit. So when I have numbers that have different numbers of decimal places, it can be kind of easy to see where that is and where we would need to round accordingly. Now, what about in the second example? In the second example, I have no decimal places. I just have whole numbers. So what do I do in that case? Well, again, I have to remember where are my significant digits? So the last significant digit in this first number is here in the hundreds place, this nine. Remember these two zeros Zeros on the end of a number are not significant unless there's a decimal point. So we can pretty safely assume that those two numbers are not significant digits. They're just there to make sure that we are looking at the right number, 19,900 as opposed to 199. So 
That hundreds place number is an estimated digit, which means that this hundreds place number is also an estimated digit. Now on the second number, 375, that five is an estimated digit, which means that this five is also an estimated digit as well. Now the rules say I can only have one estimated digit and it's gonna have to be the least precise digit which would be this one on the left. Now, how do we know when to round up or down? Well, we're gonna to go to a relatively simple rule for this kind of idea. It's the next door neighbor rule. So I'm looking at this too. The next door neighbor rule says, if that next door neighbor is five or up, round up. If that next door neighbor is four or below, then we need to round down. Well, two is certainly below four, so we're going to have to round down, which means that 19,525 is actually going to be 19,500. That is going to be our correct value with the correct number of significant digits. And so that's what we have to work off of as far as adding and subtracting goes. And it can be a little bit confusing because we're going to introduce a new rule here in just a moment. <laughs> oh, excuse me. That has nothing to do with where the digits are. It only has to do with how many digits there are. So... It's important that you keep straight these rules. Add and subtract, it's about place. Multiply and divide, it's about numbers. So let's take a look at that second set of rules. When we multiply and divide with significant figures, we wanna look at the number of significant digits and round to the number of digits that has the, the measurement that has the fewest digits. And so again, it goes to this idea of precision. The more digits that a number has, the generally greater precision we think it to, to have. And so from this perspective, if I look at this number of digits here that I'm multiplying together, I see that I have three significant figures here. I have four significant figures here. And I only have two significant figures here. So this measurement is the least precise. This one is the most precise. We want to round in a way that to help our least precise estimation. And so even though the calculator spits out this number, we only want to round it to two significant figures. The second significant figure is this nine. And so the next door neighbor here would be the one to tell us whether we're rounding up or down. Since it's a one, we would round down we're gonna round this number off to 29. And so that's the principle that we have to work off of when we're le learning um, multiplying and dividing rules. Now, we will use these rules far more often than adding and subtracting because most of the kinds of unit conversions and, and equation calculations that we do usually involve mathematical things being multiplied or divided by each other, not added and subtracted. So over time, we're going to get a lot better at using this rule. It's going to be the other rule, the adding and subtracting rule that we're going to have to really watch ourselves on and make sure that we apply correctly. Let's do a couple more of examples before um, I close out this video and I'll let you go ahead and try out the next step on your homework. So here's our first one. I have an addition problem. 14.6608 plus 12.2 plus 1.500000 times 10 to the second. Now, just for our own sake and sanity here, uh, we're going to convert this into decimal form so that we know how many digits that we're working with.
And so we know that we're going to have to move this decimal place two spots to the right. And so that's going to give us 150.0000. And so since this is all adding and subtracting, I look and I see, okay, four decimal places here, one decimal place here, four decimal places here. I need to go off of my least precise measurement. That would be the one with the one decimal place. So my answer is going to end up having one decimal place as well. 14.6608 plus 12.2 plus 150.0000. My calculator spits out 176.8608. But keeping in mind our weakest link principle here, I've got just one decimal place to work with. So I need to round my answer to that first decimal place. The next door neighbor there is a six, so I'm gonna round it up. So 176.9 is going to be the answer that I'm looking for off of this particular problem. For this last one, we talked a little bit about, okay, there are gonna be chance, times where we have to use multiplication and division of scientific notation. This is one of those occasions. And so being able to utilize that scientific notation button on your calculator is going to be really important to solving these kinds of problems correctly. Um, so first and foremost, let's put the numbers in and see what the calculator tells us. I get 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative eighth multiplied by 4 times 10 to the tenth divided by 6.65 times 10 to the 45th. My calculator spits out a gigantic mess here. 3.3082706677 times 10 to the negative 43rd. <clears throat> okay, just because my calculator gave me all of these digits doesn't mean that they actually mean anything. I got to go back to my significant figure rules and figure out how many digits I'm supposed to have. So I go ahead and I look and I say, okay, well, hold on. Scientific notation tells me there are two here, one here, and three here. Weakest link principle says that I need to round to my least precise measurement. My least precise measurement has three significant, or excuse me, has one significant digit on it. And so that one significant digit is this first one. I look next door. Three is not going to round that up to four. It's going to stay. It's going to be three times 10 to the negative 43rd. That is going to be the number that I write for this calculation. All right. One last thing that I want to talk about uh, before we call this off here. And it is, what if, I, what if I have a mixture of functions? What if I have to do adding and subtracting, then multiply and divide? Or vice versa, what if I have to do multiplication and then um, subtraction? Well, in those cases, first and foremost, you want to follow the order of operations. And so as much as you can, Try to do all of the addition and subtraction at the same time. Try to do all the multiplication and division at the same time. But when you finish with a function, you have to round it. So if, let's say that we were going to do part one and then part two. So this was the numerator of our a fraction. This is the denominator of the fraction. Well, what we would do is we would do all of this adding first we would round the answer, and then we would do our multiplying and dividing, round that answer, and then take the two against each other. So basically, every time you switch functions, so if you switch from adding and subtracting to multiplying and dividing, or multiplying and dividing to adding and subtraction, 
Once you finish one set of functions, round, and then do the other set of functions and round again. So you might end up rounding twice or even a couple of extra times in a given homework problem based upon what you're being asked to do. But that is all for this particular lesson. And so what I want you to do is as you're going through the homework, um, if you run into problems, make sure that you leave that kind of a comment for me in the text of that assignment. And please keep in mind, um, Mastering requires me to give an answer uh, for a multiple choice problem like the one that I have for that feedback question. All of the answers are going to get marked correct. So please be honest. Don't go searching for the correct answer. Try or hit, you know, um, correct if it marks you wrong. Understand, I'm going to go back and mark all of those responses correct. Let me know what you're feeling and what you're going through right now. It'll make things a lot easier for me trying to figure out how to plan these next couple of lessons if I know, hey, everybody's doing okay, or hey, I maybe need to slow down a little bit and, and talk about this a little bit more in depth. So with that being said, that's all for this particular lecture and all for this particular study. Thank you for your attention, and I will see you in class.